Today's message is entitled Paragraph, Part of the Story, and I want to welcome you on this Palm Sunday 2016. You know, when we read one paragraph in a book, we don't necessarily understand the whole story. How many of you have got a few paragraphs in your life's history that if we only read one or two of those paragraphs, we wouldn't get the whole story? And uh, aren't you thankful that there's uh, more chapters to be written as we trust and follow the Lord? Amen? Amen. Two weeks ago, I was working out at the gym, and uh, I've been doing it more than every two weeks. But um, (laughs) in fact, um, I'm gimping around here a little bit today. I'm feeling better, but I stretched a tendon or a ligament or something in my knee, and it's working this morning, thank God. I couldn't put any weight at all on it on thir- on Friday, and so praise God, I'm putting full weight on it today. That's a good thing, and uh, believing for a full recovery. I've had lots of prayer, and I believe in prayer. I believe in healing. Amen. And so um, I'm thankful for that. Been been working out with my son. My son Reese is now a little bit stronger than Dad. I don't like that at all. And he is busting my chops trying to uh, push dad to get stronger and healthier, and I'm glad for the support. Uh, and uh, so we, we li- overdid it a little bit on the uh, ecliptical, and while I was slowing down doing interval training, my, uh, I almost fell off. My knee popped and, and almost fell off. But that's part of the story. Um, there's more to the story. Uh, Two weeks ago when I was working out at the gym, I walked by a huge guy. Now, when I say a huge guy, he was a big guy. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm six foot six and 300 and none of your business. And uh, (laughs) I walked by a huge guy who had loose fitting clothing on and he was modest, but I could tell that he was totally ripped with muscles sticking through his clothes. And I was walking by him, I I was gawking. Um, I just couldn't help myself, I was gawking at him and he looked back at me and it it was like mutual admiration there going for a moment and uh, And you know, you're thinking when you see a guy like this, I mean, you know, muscles everywhere. And I'm thinking, man, you know, this guy probably hasn't worked out much in his life. He just woke up that way, you know. And, and man, those kind of guys just aggravate me to pieces. And, uh, but we began to talk for a few minutes and he began to encourage me. Come to find out this guy had 8% body fat. That's just not right. <laughs> Then I find out some more of the story. He tells me he lost 120 120 pounds of mostly body fat and then gained back 85 pounds of muscle. Told me some of his journey and what a journey the man has been on. Told me of his insecurities, of his weight, a few things about his life that I would have never known just looking at him on that day. Um, Today's message entitled Paragraph, Part of the Story, uh, and it's titled that because one paragraph in a biography doesn't always give us the whole picture of a person. This was the story of the Apostle Peter. If we wrote your biography, how many hope that... um, that there are some parts of the story that we don't forget, mostly about what Jesus is doing in our lives and what he has done. Amen. Let's pray here for a moment. Father, I thank you. What a beautiful uh, spirit in the house. I thank you, Lord, for a tremendous season of uh, life groups with the men and the women and, and in our homes and various things going on. Lord, I thank you that we have become more than a church of Sunday morning but there are relationships that are being nurtured and cultivated. We realize, Lord, that we can't uh, grow as disciples only sitting in straight lines looking at a pastor preach a message. We need uh, you. We need one another. We need to cultivate relationships 
in our homes, in life groups, with relationships that will be meaningful for life. And I thank you, Lord, that that is being added to our church day by day, month by month. I thank you for the way people are embracing this. I know, uh, Lord, just by being close to a few guys around a table the last six weeks for me, uh, I, feel, I feel closer to the whole body because I have some people that we get to talk and pray with and talk about the things of the Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for these opportunities that are provided here at our church. And I thank you, Lord, that we can live for you in and the, the reason we can is purely by your grace. 2,000 years ago, you went up a hill called Calvary and laid down your life so each one of us could live, truly live. And our best isn't good enough to deserve your love, and our worst isn't bad enough to keep us from your love. Thank you for grace, and may we not disgrace your grace, nor take it for granted or abuse it, and may your grace flow through us in such a way that others may see it in action. I pray this on Palm Sunday, when those 2,000 years ago you entered into Jerusalem and prepared to die for us. Thankfully, the story didn't end there. Resurrection Sunday morning was on its way. We give you praise today, Lord. Amen and amen. Matthew 26 69 through 75 says, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, You were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, You must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore, I curse on me. A, Peter swore, A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. Palm Sunday represents a day 2,000 years ago when the crowds at Jerusalem cheered Jesus as the new king. Hosanna, they shouted as he came and made his entrance into Jerusalem. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But just a few days later, that same crowd are now shouting shouts, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Those same inconsistencies still seem to be part of human nature. We all have witnessed how quickly public opinion can turn. In today's world, you may be celebrated as a superstar one day, and your reputation may be literally down the drain the next day. But there was something else to notice that must have hurt Jesus even more than the turnabout in his public opinion as he marched into Jerusalem as they were crying shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. And a few days later, they were shouting crucify him. There was something else that must have hurt even more. It was the fact that even his closest friends, followers, and especially his disciples left him in an hour of despair. Peter was one of the Lord's disciples. Peter had many good qualities leadership potential he was zealous for the kingdom of god and he was a fighter one to change the world in the name of our great god one to speak up he was the kind of guy that would speak up he was willing to lay down his life for the good fight once peter swore an oath to jesus never to fail him he said lord i'm ready to go with you to prison and even to die for you but from our text today we realize that Peter did not live up to his promise. He denies Jesus. Peter had to learn something that day that I think all of us have to learn. It's only through the grace of God that we stand. It's only through the grace of God that we can make good on our promises to serve the Lord. We need his strength. Can you say amen? amen. 
I believe that's true for every person here today. If you're brand new in your walk with the Lord or you've been serving God for a long time, it's only by his grace that we stand. Much later in life, Peter writes in his first epistle, and look what Peter writes many years later after the death of Jesus and the resurrection and the ascension to heaven. And now Peter is writing as one of the older apostles that is still living, and he writes in his first epistle, and he says in 1 Peter 5, 12, my purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Peter had learned the lesson the hard way. We stand fast in the grace of God alone. We may not have all the answers, amen? We don't have all the answers in life. And we may not fully even understand our salvation. But we can stand, endure, and prevail when we stand in the grace of God. And that is the good news. God tells us today on this Palm Sunday, if we fail once, don't raise your hand, but how many have failed once? If we fail twice, how many have messed up at least twice in your life? If we mess up three times, has anybody messed up three times? How many hope we don't keep counting? Here's the good Bible news. I, I hope you understand this is not just good preaching material, but the Bible news. And when I read about Peter, the apostle, who failed the Lord, who denied him. On the night when they came in and arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that very day, that very night before the rooster crowed three times, whether it was a rooster or whether it was a rabbi, and we have, we have lots of history, the point is, Peter denied him. That same Peter got up because he who began a good work in Peter will complete it in him. He who has began a good work in you can complete it. We can get up when we fail in Christ Jesus. We can get up in his grace and in his mercy for our lives. Aren't you thankful for Jesus today and the grace of God upon our lives that we can get up? Where would we be without, under, without that understanding? We can stand not because of our power, but because of the power of God's Spirit. You know why I'm saying that right now. I can almost sense, and I don't know who I'm speaking to specifically, but I almost get a sense of, yeah, man, I have messed up. I have failed God. I've had seasons in my life where I just let myself completely withdraw from a relationship with the Lord, from, from serving the body of Christ, from being involved in letting the cares of this world and the dictates of my flesh literally take me to a place in life that I was never meant to be because God reached down and saved me one day. And I want to tell you, if that's you here today, thank God for his grace that we could humble ourselves and recognize it's only by his grace that we could be here today. It's only by his grace that we could be in our right mind it's only by his grace that we could even have anything within us that desires a relationship with the Lord. When you think about it, it is so humbling that it causes you not to, to be down about somebody else's faith and realize the only hope that any of us have is because of what Jesus did for us. And it puts us in a great place to understand. At the end of his life, Peter fulfilled his promise to die for Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter ended up dying for Jesus. The denial was, was only part of the story. This was the same Peter who had cursed Jesus in order to save his own life. One paragraph doesn't tell the whole story. I'm so glad that as I walk with many of you through the years and you've walked with me and we serve God together, aren't you glad that one paragraph don't tell the whole story? Peter frequently represented the 
apostle of little faith. So the question becomes, how can we know our faith is ineffective? And I'm going to give you some things real quickly here. Ineffective faith attempts to anticipate God's plan. Oh, isn't that true? Don't we, don't we want to anticipate how God's going to do the next thing for us? How he's going to do that? I mean, you know what? I almost am learning. I, I won't say this is, uh, you know, exactly 100% correct, but most of the time in my life, when I attempt to show God that I've got him figured out, he is able to tell me in many ways that I don't. He can show up and be God all by himself, and he can accomplish things in ways that I would never imagine. Ineffective faith attempts to anticipate God's plan. Abram and Sarah had trouble believing God's promise that they would have a child when he didn't come in the time they thought he should. So Sarai takes matters into her own hands by giving Hagar, her servant, to her husband. Now Hagar is having her husband's child. The Bible says the wild one is born, Ishmael. And even though God forgives and restores and Abraham and Sarah received their promised son, Isaac, Abraham still had to deal with his son, Ishmael. You know, when we go off and decide to help God out, a lot of times we create things in our lives that we then have to deal with. When we ask God for something and have to wait, it's a temptation to take matters into our own hands and interfere with God's plans. Secondly, ineffective faith is marked by a lack of trust in God. Trapped against the sea, the Israelites faced the Egyptian army sweeping in for the kill. The Israelites thought they were doomed. After watching God's powerful hand deliver them from Egypt, their only response now was fear, whining, and despair. Where was their trust in God? Israel had to learn from repeated experiences that God was able to provide for them. God had preserved these examples in the Bible so that you and I today can learn to trust the Lord. I want to just say that to you before I move on to the next point. You can trust the Lord. We can trust him. We can trust him. Thirdly, ineffective faith is marked by an unchanged life. John compared people who claim they believe in God but do not live for him to be unprotected unproductive trees that will be cut down. God's people will produce a crop and bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work in their lives. Matthew 3, 8 says, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. I love this Oswald Chambers quote. And he says this, Oswald Chambers. For one man who can introduce another to Jesus Christ by the way he lives and by the atmosphere of his life, there are a thousand who can only talk jargon about him. You know, we can make people homesick for God by how we live the changed life that he gave us on the cross. Fourth, ineffective faith seldom goes beyond words. The apostle, let me say that again, ineffective faith seldom goes beyond words. The apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 19, but I will come and soon if the Lord lets me and then I'll find out whether these arrogant people just give pretentious speeches or whether they really have God's power. You know, some folks talk a lot about faith, but that's all it is, is talk. They know all the right words to say, but their lives don't always reflect God's power. Preachers have to be real careful about this because we talk a lot. You know, I tell people it's, it's easier to preach this stuff than to actually live it out. But God would have us to live in the power of his righteousness, in the power of his strength and might, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that the kingdom of God is to be lived our lives can prove that God's power is real those were four things in knowing if our faith is ineffective so I want to switch it and ask how can we know our faith is effective number one effective faith if you want to know if your faith is being effective number one effective faith depends on God 
We see an account in the Bible where this happens to the apostles. In Luke 17, 5, the apostles said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. The kind of faith we need is total dependence on God and a willingness to do his will. Faith is not a show. Faith is not a show. It's a growing and humble obedience to God as we depend upon him. Secondly, effective faith rests on what Christ has done. Do we understand that what Jesus did was enough? It was enough. We don't need to strive anymore. While we labor in the work of the Lord, we get to rest in his love. There's work in the kingdom, but we don't have to strive. Big difference. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. The third thing about effective faith is it grows under pressure. Yeah. It grows under pressure. Anybody got any pressure on you? Anybody ever had pressure? When faith is strong, the results are huge. When faith is strong, you walk in joy and peace. Joy and peace for a child of God is not for just when everything's going right. It's when there's struggle going on, when there's pressure. We get to walk in joy and peace when there's pressure. As my daddy used to say, when the hens won't lay and the roof leaks and you're stuck on tracks late for church and the wife's building a doghouse and you don't have a dog, you know it's for you. <laughs> There's joy and peace. When you have faith in the Lord, you can walk through some pretty tough times with joy, with a peace knowing that we have faith in God you know when we have faith that grows under pressure we have love for others it's what Galatians 5 6 tells us we have more of the spirit working in our lives Galatians 3 5 we have power over Satan's attacks Ephesians 16 and we have growing obedience Hebrews 11 8 obedience flows naturally from faith Listen to me now. I want you to catch this. Whatever I trust the most to satisfy me, I desire the most. And whatever I desire the most, I obey the most. Let me run that by you another way. If I trust money the most, I obey money. If I trust Jesus the most, I obey Jesus. It's not complicated, but it is a battle. So fight with prayer over God's word until tr you trust Jesus as your all-satisfying treasure. Because I want to tell you, he is your all-satisfying treasure. Jesus is the only thing that will satisfy you. And when you do, you will desire Jesus the most, obey Jesus the most, and be satisfied the most when we trust him. Jesus, let me say it this way, Jesus is our heart's most satisfying treasure. Fourth, effective faith becomes stronger through endurance. Listen to the Hebrew writer. He says this in Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, so do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. When an oak tree endures the test of wind, rain, and storms, it becomes stronger. I have 100-year-old oak trees in the ravine of my backyard. 
Sometimes when the wind is strong and the leaves are full in the summertime, I watch those trees and they move at the tops a huge distance. Sometimes when I'm watching them, I start praying for them. But you know, those trees are strong. They're amazing to me. And someone needs to hear this today. Somebody here, probably this is a word directly for you, even though it could fit everybody. If you don't quit, you're going to get stronger. I know what it is to be on a desert road 800 miles from home as a 21-year-old young man with three sisters and an old Greyhound bus, a 1955 Greyhound bus that was wore out before we bought it. It was wore out times three. We're 800 miles from home in Tucumcari, New Mexico, on our way to El Paso to sing for Jesus. And the rod in the engine in the back of the bus in that Detroit 671 engine had a rod in it that said, I want out, I want out, I want out, I want out. And it made its way out. And that old bus, we were broken down. Motorcycle guy came by and somehow got it started and we crippled it into town to Tucumcari, found ourselves at a campsite on a Saturday, had to cancel our meeting, had barely enough money to get to El Paso, didn't know what I was going to do. In myself, scared half to death. My three sisters with me. I grabbed some albums. Those are large CDs. walked down the street, said, Lord, I need your help, but I'm trusting you. I'm going to take a step, but I'm trusting you, Lord. First little church I came to on a corner in the town of Tucumcari was a little Assembly of God church. On a Saturday afternoon, the guy, there was a guy out there mowing the yard. He was mowing, I was going to say he was mowing the grass, he was mowing the weeds. And uh, I stopped him and said, hey, um, told him who I was and told him we were broke down on our way to El Paso and that we were a singing group. And um, asked him if he knew who the pastor was. I'd like to talk to him about maybe singing in the morning. And uh, the guy looked at me and said, yeah, I'm the pastor. And uh, he said, uh, young man, just get in the car and go with me. I said, okay. I didn't know where we were going. Pulls up to the local radio station. We march in there. He does a live interview, plays one of our songs, and announces to the city on radio that the Living Light Singers are going to be singing at the church in the morning. The guy didn't know me at all. We didn't fit through any. That's why... I like protocols and processes, and I like things having a way that we do things in a channel. But how many know you always got to leave a little opening for the Holy Spirit to do something a little bit different than what you plan? Amen? I'm sitting here telling the story, and Terry's, I see, I just caught Terry in my eye, and it seems like another life ago, hon, we were there, and I was literally greasy from working on that bus with albums. That was during the time I had my afro. <laughs> I permed an afro, big old brown-headed afro. What a sight I must have been. Grease on my nose, introducing myself to the pastor, and he says, yes, there is a God. And uh, we're on our way back, and I said, um, pray for us. I don't know where we're going to stay while the uh, bus is in the shop this week. It's going to take a couple weeks. We're going to be stranded here. 
He said, well, son, let me, let me help you out with that. He said, uh, I just took this church. I've been an evangelist for 20 years. About that time, he pulls around behind the church to a brand new Airstream travel trailer. He said, I hadn't had a chance to sell my Airstream. We just bought our home and moved in last week, and the Airstream travel trailer is all set up, plugged in, air conditioning, running water, beautiful. You guys can have it for as long as you need it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, God has a way of taking care. Harold Woodson gets a hold of me. Anybody remember Harold? He's in Carlsbad, New Mexico, three hours south. Finds out the trouble we're in, rents us a car, and we drive down there for a whole week of meetings. They hardly let us sing. They just let us sit there and heal and sing a little bit. Craziest church I've ever been to in my life. They had about 400 people. One night we sang one song, and they all got up and started marching around the church. Before long, they left the church. <laughs> While we were singing, they left. Pastor says, keep on singing, they'll be back. <laughs> they had windows, and they were marching around the church. Pretty soon they came back, and they blessed on us. They gave us money. They fed us. They took care of us. They treated us like their children. You can depend on the Lord. Some of the things that we walk through, God will use to build an increase, put increase in your life because what he has planned ahead for you will be marvelous. Peter was rehabbed in a paragraph where our resurrected Jesus did not forget Peter who had denied him. I love this verse when you know the story of Peter. The angel said, don't be alarmed in Mark 16, 6 and 7. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. This is, this is after Jesus rose from the dead. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples Look what Jesus says, including Peter. I love that. Don't forget Peter. He denied me, but I'm not going to forget him. I put my name in there sometimes. Maybe you could put your name in there. Go and tell him. Don't forget Tim that Jesus is going ahead of you. Jesus is going ahead of you, saints. Jesus said he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And impressed by the way in which Peter and thousands of other Christians died, a Roman historian wrote this. He said, if the Christian faith is worth dying for, perhaps it's also worth living for. Let's learn from Peter, who learned to stand and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit despite human weaknesses. Did you know that the grace of God working in our lives will give us the ability to serve each other when we don't always agree with each other? One paragraph in our life doesn't have to be the whole story. Can I ask you a favor? Be patient with me. Be patient with each other. Be patient with the people you serve with. Be patient with the flesh that you don't like in others. You got a little hanging on yourself. Be patient with decisions you may not agree with and let's take it to the Lord and allow love to rule our hearts because God's love never fails. Question today, are you allowing the grace of God to see you through everything in your life? Are you allowing the grace of God to see you through the ministry that you serve or have you allowed circumstances to prevail? Are you allowing the grace of God to stand tall in the midst of a family or a marriage situation? Is the grace of God being allowed to work through your finances or are you making quick decisions that go against godly character that should be working 
in all of us. On this Palm Sunday, we know this. Jesus went all the way for us. Because of that, only because he went all the way for us can we go all the way for him in his power. Now, I want to share with you something. Friday morning, Ben Benedict and I put our work behind for a couple hours, took off for a pond and decided to go fishing. On this particular day, the only day in my lifetime, I was a little better fisherman than Ben. <laughs> the last time we went fishing, he totally skunked me. I got zero. He got a stringer full. And he enjoyed it too much. <laughs> well, I didn't skunk him, but I got a few more. And he helped me out because I realized, you know, I want to show you a crappie that I caught Friday morning. We have a picture of that. How I many know that's a pretty nice crappie right there? Now I want to tell you that's only part of the story. Here's the rest of the story. Look at me for a minute. Keep that picture up there. That fish is only about that long. <laughs> ben showed me a trick. He said, hold that fish out there as far as you can, and I'm going to get as close to it as I can with the camera, my phone, and we're going to make that fish look like a beast. <laughs> the real story is only, that fish is only that big. Now, here's how you can really tell if you're sharp. Look at the size of my hand. <laughs> Compared to the size of my other hand, Doggone it, why did I give away that secret? <laughs> We're going to share a special song right now. Come on up, you guys. And I want to remind you that as you go through life, whatever may have hindered you, can simply become part of your story. Listen to this while they get ready. Listen to this real quick. Jesus already knew our denials and failures. Jesus already knew your shortcomings. He already knew your denials. He already knew your failures. And he still chose to go to the cross for you and me. What, what is that? How does that speak to your heart this morning? Yeah, Peter denied Christ three times. But did you know this? He denied him three times, but on the day of Pentecost, do you know who it was that got up and preached and 3,000 souls were saved? Do you know who it was? Peter. He got up with faith and strength of the Lord on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved in one day. That's a thousand percent increase for each one of his denials. Peter messed up, but his story got stronger. We can stay seated as we consider God's grace in this song that we want to share with you. And I want to invite you to just be seated and instead of maybe participating by singing it, uh, I'd like you to do something that you're not used to doing. I want you to just sit there and soak in it. I want you to take these words in on the screen and uh, let this song touch your life. His victory on the cross is ours. It's a gift. Let's pray, Lord. I just believe that there are people here today that before this afternoon is complete, there will be calls made with relationships with friends. 
And we'll say, let's pray for one another. And we'll stand strong in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ that we'll, re we'll desire to remain humble before the Lord and allow his strength that we will be finishers of our faith, not people who just begin. There's a lot who begin. But Lord, you want us to be finishers. The Lord says we can come out of hiding. We're safe here with him. There's no need to cover what he already sees. I pray, Lord, that as you prepared for the greatest part of the story 2,000 years ago, you went all the way to the cross and died for me and my brothers and sisters here. May this week, may this week, Lord, be special in our devotions as we read through your story from death to resurrection life in Matthew 21 through 28, that we take some time this week to walk that Via Della Rosa, so to speak, and walk with you and thank you each day for what you endure, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We thank you, Lord, for your love.